James, uh, should be able to unmute yourself. I am. Hopefully, you guys can hear me. Yep. And you go ahead and introduce yourself, and I will shut up. Well, thank you, Eric. And uh, gentlemen, good afternoon. And I want to thank you guys for giving me the opportunity to speak today. Um, I need to start with a little bit of a confession. I have not been an OPSIG member for much longer than about four months now. Uh, I am not a member of the NM NMRA. I am not a member of any other of the uh, interest groups. And it was basically out of a pure opportunity that I ended up signing up for OPSIG membership back in March. And it was one of those moments It took me about three or four days of just kind of digging through back issues of, of dispatcher ops uh, and reading it and going, you moron, you should have done this sooner. So I will, I will add my, my two cents for, for this SIG uh, as the probably the youngest and newest member uh, here on this chat. And uh, when you think about all the, the great names and the great minds that have participated and written and shared with this organization, and then today you've got me, uh, kind of knocks the hell out of Darwin's theory, if I do say so. So uh, I, I, I do appreciate the opportunity. And I know that we're all kind of getting back into the world in some way, shape or form. Uh, I do hope that these continue in some way, shape or form. Uh, I think that they're a great opportunity, not just here, but throughout the entire hobby. Uh, it, it has exposed me to people that I would have never met and prior to this. So, has been a, a all of this it's been these chances to speak uh, uh all of you my name is james mcnab wife and son we live in des moines iowa and i model the iowa interstate railroad and while that may sound like the opening statement of a 12-step help program it actually defines my approach to operations on a model railroad because of the railroads that i've chosen to model uh, on a Completely personal note, I am in my day job, I am a television producer and director. Uh, I would do contract work for ABC, CBS, ESPN, Fox, uh, anybody that basically would like my services. Uh, to, to answer the question, no, I did not go to the Olympics this year, but uh, we'll try again in 2024 and see what happens. So why are we here today? If nothing else, I have learned over the past 18 months and being exposed to more clinics and more presentations than I think I ever have in my entire association with this hobby, that everybody approaches clinics a little bit differently, and I'm no exception. Uh, this is a little bit different than what you may have seen from other presentations, both here at the OpsDig and also with other groups. And one of the things that I believe is that you should not do step-by-step -step instructions, step-by-step uh, -step presentations, because the ultimate outcome of that is that your model railroad is gonna look very much like my model railroad. And I'm willing to bet money in my pocket that your goals for operating are very different than my goals for operating. So what I want to do today is really present kind of my approach to it in the hope that you, if you're interested, will adapt, adjust, and adopt to your own railroads, which may be wildly and differently unique from the one that I'm standing in front of. So because of that, I need to start off with a couple of disclaimers. And if you're a fan of what do you know, hopefully this will somewhat make sense. Number one, I am completely and without question, a modern era modeler. Everything that you see today reflects the modern era of prototype railroad. The transition era, steam locomotives, cabooses, five-man crews, that holds no appeal to me whatsoever. And so all of my approach to it is based on what I see today rail side. Number two, I have no doubt in my mind that anything that I am going to present today is in any way ground changing, earth shaking, or will make you go out and drastically change your approach. In fact, as you may hear some of the things and say, well, yeah, that, that makes sense, James. No, no <clears throat> from there. So please take that as an approach again, looking at it from how I do it in hopes that you can might be able to pull a little nugget and adopt it to your own railroad. Third, and my students will address, will confirm this, I am a very stubborn and arrogant individual in just about every aspect of my life, including my approach to this hobby. And so 
when people ask me, well, why did you do that? My default reaction is because. In fact, is my favorite thing to say to people is when they, especially in online forums or whatever, is, well, why did you choose to do this? Why did you choose to do that? And my default response is just to piss you off. That's the reason I did it. So just know that that is my approach towards just about every aspect of my life. I, I equate it to being a television producer and that mindset, but I, I have found stuff that works for me. It may not work for you. However, I am not arrogant enough to believe that my way is the only way. And when presented with better information, better opportunities, better approaches, I absolutely will adapt. And we'll talk about that a little bit in this presentation. So with that kind of out of the way, I'd like to give you a little background on kind of how I got to this point. And the way that I got to this point is because of two very distinct, but also very connected railroads. The first has, has been mentioned multiple times is the Iowa Interstate Railroad. Now, if you don't know what it is, well, shame on you. But if you don't know what it is, the Iowa Interstate is a class two regional railroad that connects Chicago to Omaha. It is actually the largest class two regional railroad, both by mileage and by size, if you don't count all the the connected ones, the Genesee Wyoming and all that other fun stuff. And it is also the only regional railroad that connects with every single class one railroad in the United States. Uh, this is former Rock Island trackage. This is the former Rock Island main line, again, Chicago to Omaha. Started in 1984 following the collapse of the rock four years earlier, and over the course of almost 40 years now, has grown and grown and grown and grown to be a pretty big powerhouse, at least in the regional class two railroading. Uh, it also has a major spur that goes from Bureau down to Peoria, Illinois, as well as sub spurs into Milan, Illinois, to Grimes, Iowa, obviously, to uh, excuse me, Harlan and Hancock, Iowa, out on the West End. The other railroad that I'm interested in is the Cedar Rapids and Iowa City Railroad in Eastern Iowa. Now the Crandick, as it's affectionately referred to, is a class three terminal railroad that connects its two namesake cities, Cedar Rapids and Iowa City. Uh, it was founded in 1904 as an electric interurban. Uh, it maintained its status until 1953 when it gave up the passenger side and did started doing freight only. Uh, and now basically focuses in and around the major industrial areas of Cedar Rapids and all of the agricultural uh, com uh, customers and industries that are located there. Uh, in 1980, the Crandick actually picked up some of the scraps of the Rock Island. Uh, they picked and also the uh, uh, Milwaukee Road. So they bought the former Milwaukee Road branch that went from Cedar Rapids all the way down to Homestead, Iowa. Uh, and then they also picked up a small eight mile branch from Iowa City down to the town of Hills, Iowa. That will play a big role here in a second. So these two railroads have always been connected from their very beginning. Uh, the Iowa Interstate was started by a group called the Heartland Rail uh, Co Corporation that was created after the collapse of the Rock Island to maintain rail service to a set of shippers in and around Iowa. Those include Archer Daniels Midland, those include Pella Roll Screen, those include Maytag, it used to be in Newton, Iowa. And the fourth participant, was the Scrandic Railroad, Cedar Rapids and Iowa City. They wanted to maintain a uh, rail service from what they had had and didn't want to be beholden to a single railroad at that time, the Chicago Northwestern, which ultimately ended up being the Union Pacific. So these two railroads have always been symbiotic. They've always been partners. They've always been uh, together and working for a common goal. So much so that uh, in 2004, the Crandick actually took back a lot of its road freights and focused more on the Cedar Rapids area and turned more of its over the road haulage to the Iowa Interstate Railroad. And that partnership has maintained ever since. Now, while that connection out in Eastern Iowa was interesting, Obviously, I got my start, and you may have heard of me, this is where the arrogance kicks in, with the line in Des Moines, Iowa, the Iowa Interstate Grimes Industrial Track. This is a small 11-mile branch that tees north just uh, from downtown Des Moines uh, up into its namesake city uh, in, in Grimes in central Iowa. Uh, 
based on that design back in 2011 when we first moved into this house uh, i designed a layout based on the grimes line as it appeared uh, at that time and it lived for a good seven years uh, i thoroughly thoroughly enjoyed that railroad both from a design uh, as well as an operational standpoint and it was my experience with that railroad that really refined what i believe makes an enjoyable operating railroad for me and what i think would work for others uh, after seven years it had gotten to the point where it really was firing on all cylinders and i was able to share it with the hobby press with a couple of other individuals and look forward to operating it for a long long time uh, mother nature had other ideas uh, this house is 98 years old therefore it has a 98 year old basement therefore we have a 98 year old neighborhood and getting water into the basement was par for the course so when i came down on a february morning of 2018 and saw this i knew that we had much bigger problems it uh, turned out that our primary sewer line had collapsed and we had to remove the entire railroad so that they could jackhammer up the entire basement to replace the sewer line all the way across the room uh, and in about six hours i destroyed seven years worth of work uh on a railroad it was it was uh phenomenally painful uh you know pride makes us artificial but humility makes us real so after a couple of months even a little bit longer of trying to get the basement back into a functional shape where it's dry where it's safe where it's relatively warm relatively clean uh the chance became then to start over and try something a little bit different uh and so my first thought was actually to do the norfolk southern here in des moines uh yes the norfolk southern does make it to des moines iowa the legacy of the old wabash uh and it's a very very interesting operation but ultimately to move to that railroad from what i had known with the iowa interstate uh, would have been a fundamental change for me uh, it would have been a, a a great reset and starting all the way over uh at, at that point and so at this phase of my life uh, at this point in the hobby i didn't really have the ability to just completely start over uh fortunately uh, i have a couple of friends in this hobby that were that were a little bit more helpful than than i was and kind of pulled me out of my modeling funk uh and this post on the moderator hobbyist blog kind of got me thinking and say gee that would be a great little uh a railroad because it turns out in the time that i had been modeling the grimes line a couple of things had changed significantly on the crandic now i talked about how the Cedar Rapids and Iowa City started focusing more on the town of Cedar Rapids more than they did Iowa City. Not only was that because of the growth of the agricultural businesses in and around Cedar Rapids, uh, obviously it's got ADM, it's got Quaker Oats, it's got uh, Cargill, uh, there's a giant paper mill there. There's a lot of very heavy industry just in that area. A lot of the customer and industry base along the line, including down in Iowa City, basically had dried up in the uh, decade or so that I had been working on the Grimes line. And it, it, the Sea Rap and Iowa City, again, with their partnership with Iowa Interstate, basically got to the point where they said, we'll handle Cedar Rapids, you take the rest. Now, the loan holdout in that agreement was Stutzman Ag Products in the town of Hills, Iowa, at the absolute southern end of the Crandix line. Uh, Stutzman ag is an agricultural provider. They receive shipments of uh, fertilizer, potash, uh, salt, a bunch of products that are then sold uh, uh, business to business uh, to, to farmers and various other local ag products. And so they still have a very active rail presence and still needed rail service. Problem was, is that it was separated by a good 33 miles from the Cedar Rapids and Iowa City's base of operations. So since they're closer to Iowa City and they're closer to the Iowa interstate, in 2012, the Crandick and the Iowa interstate partnered together and the Iowa interstate signs a five-year lease to operate the Hills line. And because it's now under Iowa interstate operations, it is referred to as the Hills Industrial Spur. And that became the motivation for my new layout. And so construction began in late 2018, early 2019, uh, as we started to kind of rebuild the basement uh, over the course of the past three years or so. Uh, it has expanded and grown and gotten into a place where it's 
fundamentally complete. There's one major section uh, left to go, but there is at least scenery tracked down in a majority of this railroad. And it's nice to have something back in the basement again after, after destroying, having to destroy uh, what I considered to be a very significant part of my modeling life. So ultimately, these two layouts, the two versions of the, of the belt, have a lot in common for obvious reasons. They're both the same prototype, they're both generally the same era, and they're both within 150 miles of the same locale. But those two railroads and the way that they approach their operations really influenced how I approach my operations on this layout because of what it is not. This is not mainline railroad. This is not uh, uh, what Bill Darnaby calls macro operations. This is the micro approach to model railroading. You are talking single car movements. You are talking about that last mile switching, or if you flip it, the first mile switching. Just that last little percentage of what a car needs to do to either be placed at a spot or pulled from a spot. A lot of the interaction that you see on the prototypes and therefore that you traditionally see in a model railroad simply does not exist in this layout. Uh, there is no need for a dispatcher on this layout because of the nature of this operation. There is no need for blocking of trains because they're coming out already blocked. There is none of that. I, I, I heard a great analogy uh, about two weeks ago. It's the equivalent of trying to look at an elephant and only seeing its toenail. That toenail is really what I'm focusing on. And it's been thoroughly enjoyable for me, but I am willing to believe that it's not enjoyable for a lot of other people. That's okay. It's simply part of how I approach uh, model railroading. So let's talk a little bit about kind of a day in the life of a crew on the Hills line and what they go through to get the job done. Uh, so we're gonna start at the dead center of the model portion of the railroad. This is the hill track and the maiden lane interchange. So the way it works in Iowa City and on the hill. Okay, go ahead. All right. So as I was mentioning, uh, this is the interchange point between the two railroads, the Iowa Interstate and the Crandon. And for the better part of their relationship, this is where the interchange happened between the two railroads, both to get stuff down to Iowa City, but also get it up to Cedar Rapids. Over the course of the time, uh, the Iowa Interstate has, and the Crandick have built a new connection just outside the town of Homestead using that former Milwaukee Road branch uh, that connects the two, the two railroads. Uh, and so they've been able to move the interchange out of Iowa City, which is a boon to, for, for, for crews and for customers and also for the city itself, because you're not blocking up uh, 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 countless grade crossings, trying to get larger and larger trains uh, interchange between the two. But in my model era, that interchange point kind of recame, recame back because it connects the Iowa Interstate's yard with the Maiden Lane, Maiden Lane Interchange, excuse me, down what's called the Hill Track. Uh, the Hill Track is about a, hmm, maybe a little, little, little under a quarter of a mile uh, interchange track that gets its name because it's got a phenomenally steep grade uh, coming down to it. And so trains can basically just kind of coast all the way down and then they've got to go to run eight to move up. So this is where the day kind of starts on the railroad. Uh, but the nice thing is, is that I don't need countless miles of staging track to simulate these operations. A single track, a single staging track that sits behind a view block is more than enough. What do I lose by this? Well, you lose the block. You lose the beginning of the day. You lose the yard operations. Now, it's real easy to kind of get a train started. Uh, uh, on the hills line because directly underneath uh, the bench work of where Maidenlane is, I have this small cabinet that I keep excess rolling stock on. And as trains are built, the things are, cars are literally swapped from one to the other. The track acts more like a fiddle track than a true passive staging track, but it is a staging track. Let's, let's be very, very clear. The advantage of this is that I can reset and be ready to go in a matter of seconds. Um, I have had operators over, uh, both in this layout and also on the previous layout on the Grimes line, which followed the same approach as this. And we would just be able to cycle through very quickly. It would take 30 to seconds to reset 
and go. The longest that it took was basically waiting for the new uh, yard report to print out and become available. So just being able to turn a railroad around very quickly and not have to wait for every single aspect of it to finish before the next session begins, to me, is a, is a great appeal. Now, I've mentioned this a couple of times. Here's the formal statement on it. Uh, yeah, I give up a lot. Uh, at least by focusing on such that narrow edge, the very beginning and the very end of the day. In fact, is after a couple of years of having that same setup on the Grimes line, I went back and added uh, a segment of more of the uh, mainline Iowa interstate so that I could actually replicate that actual start of the day, where the yard, where the blocking was happening. I do not have that opportunity in this layout design right now without doing some significant changes to the footprint that it takes up. And the phase of life that I am in, the phase of life that my family is in, I don't want to occupy more of the space of this layout than what I have done, uh, more of the space of this basement for the layout, excuse me, than what I I have done already. So I'm, I'm, that is something that as time progresses, I may be eating crow. I may be coming back to you guys in a couple of years and say, I put a whole new yard in just to be able to simulate that aspect. But right now, after about two, three years of operation, I'm very contented with this approach. So I mentioned that kind of that first step, last step uh, 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 approach to car movement. And so it really, since you've got so much that is not present on this layout, the focus then becomes how do you make it enjoyable, or at least how do you make it challenging? And what I found for myself is really by focusing on the procedures, the practices, policies, and procedures that the railroad uh, goes about to conduct its daily business, as opposed to the placements of the cars, that for me is enjoyable. So to make those procedures come alive, to make them so where we can understand them, I need a couple of tools to do the job. And this is where the modeling of paperwork really comes into play, which I think is essential, regardless of your aeroscale locale or approach towards uh, prototype model railroading. So the first is the actual car, uh, car forwarding system and solution we used. And after a couple of years, I've been able to standardize on this approach using Robert Bowdridge's switch list for Mac application. Some of you may be familiar with that. I think it's a great application. I know that Robert has kind of, I, I don't want to say he's abandoned it, but it, 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 it's, it hasn't been updated in a while, but it's still available for free from the Apple store. And about, it was 10 years ago now, uh, I reached out to Robert and said, how can I make this look exactly like the Iowa interstate paperwork that the crews used. And Robert was very grateful uh, and very gracious to be able to, uh, gracious, not grateful, he was probably annoyed at me. Uh, he was gracious to be able to work with me to develop a version of this application that perfectly replicates the paperwork that Iowa interstate crews get. Now, if you download the app, you will see a version of the hit, the switch was called the pickle report. And that was my return contribution back to Robert for all of his help uh, that kind of emulates the rail management system, train management system software that uh, the Iowa interstate uses. It's not an exact match because we don't want to have lawyers banging down our doors, but it kind of helps give that approach. Um, I, I will gladly concede one of the big arguments against computer generated paperwork is that it does not do a good job of keeping track of calls. That is absolutely true, and this is no exception. But I'm dealing with small trains. We're dealing with five, maybe six cars at a time. If something gets out of sync, it's real easy to fix. I can't recommend this for larger layouts, but for my layout and for this type of layout, it absolutely works perfect. And so running this software has, has been able, is, is to me is key in kind of creating that environment and knowing exactly where a car is supposed to go or be pulled from and exactly where it's going to eventually end up while keeping you in the environment of a prototype op day on the Iowa interstate. Uh, the downside of this, uh, and I've mentioned, uh, is that it hasn't been updated in a while. And that also means that it's not all running on the latest operating systems for Mac. And so I have a classic Mac mini sitting on the bottom shelf uh, of the benchwork that is keeping the software alive. Uh, if and when 
when that actually dies, I'm going to be up a creek without a ladder, uh, and and I uh, uh, will probably need to consider a completely different approach at that point. But at this point, I'm just going to keep soldering on. Uh, it continues to work. It continues to work very very well. Now this is designed to be printed out, obviously on a standard letter size uh, sheet of paper. I will admit that I do not use uh, the the paperwork when it's just me operating. I'll generate the paperwork, look at it, and I know because of the other of the just my knowledge of the of the prototype. Okay, this goes here, that goes there, got that that goes there. You can fundamentally generate that by rolling dice or by pulling cards out of you know just randomly selecting stuff. It'll ultimately give you the same approach. But when I do have guests over, when I do have operators over, we need a way to be able to impart this information. I have a small printer sitting over in the corner. It's hooked up to this to the computer running the application. We can print out a, a new guard report in a matter of seconds. But the thing that really keeps uh, the, the that has to be printed and has to be available is all the other supporting paperwork to help me and more importantly to help my guests replicate a day on the Iowa interstate. So with some, I will say, insider information from some friends in low places, both at, at the railroads and mentioned, but also a couple other places, I've been able to develop a series of forms that all fit on a single clipboard that allow you to, if not perfectly duplicate, at least create the environment of a day with the crew on the prototypes. So the first piece of document is basically directly lifted from the Iowa Interstate Employee Timetable. Uh, on the left-hand side is a string line diagram. Uh, this is based off Iowa Interstate Engineering uh, documents, at least as far as layout and nomenclature and notations. Uh, and it shows every single thing on the line from north to south of my modeled portion. It shows every single grade crossing, shows every single turnout, shows every single bridge, shows every single obstruction on the line. And that is what is used to reference where you are and versus where you need to go on the line. Uh, this fundamentally works. You, there are variations of this that we see on railroads all the time uh, as far as uh, facial mounted diagrams or uh, handbooks that are held and carried around. This just fits in one sheet and it gives you the ability just to look up and down and know, OK, here's where I am in reference to everything else. On the right hand side is lifted, in fact, is copied uh, from the Iowa Interstate Special Instructions uh, as part of their employee timetable. A couple of the things have been rewritten to reflect the railroad itself as opposed to the prototype, but in a couple of things are specific to the layout itself and don't appear in the timetable. But again, they all follow the same formatting, the same style, the same approach uh, to it. This is basically the instruction manual. And you basically has gotten to the point, depending on how comfortable an operator is, that I can more or less hand it to them. And that's everything that they need to know. Because one thing that I've become very aware of is as a layout owner, at least early on, I was way too involved in the operating sessions. I was way too, well, you need to do this, you need to do that. Well, that's not fun for the guests. So I've gotten myself over the years, basically the equivalent of tossing the keys at them and saying, have a good time. You're not going to break anything and we'll figure it out if it's a problem. So it just being able to give them some type of documentation to say, have you checked this first? After that, I'll gladly step in, as opposed to what I did at least initially, which was, okay, I'll help you, I'll help you, I'll help you, uh, and then stepping back. So one thing that I will say, at least relates to the streamline diagram, again, because this is micro uh, operation as opposed to macro operation, we don't have towns. Uh, there's only two towns on this line and there's not a lot of space in, be in between them. So we're not moving, we're not trying to do uh, referencing town over town or station or points on a timetable. And so the best way to do it, at least on this type of, of uh, railroad, is to use roads themselves. So every single grade crossing on the layout is labeled with both the street name and the uh, mile post. I also do the same for all the bodies of water. And that's how you cross reference between the string line diagram and the layout itself. Um, I, I've moved again with this layout. I wanted to have a simply cleaner fascia than what I had on the Grimes line and even on previous layouts. Uh, and so this is probably going to be the extent of any type of labeling that I'm going to have uh, on, on the layout. Uh, these were plastic signs I picked up the, from an online supplier and they've, they've 
worked out perfectly well. And I'm, I'm very happy with both how they look aesthetically and also how they operate. Uh, the second document is really the, the meat and potatoes. And this is the customer diagram for the whopping two customers that are on the Hills line. Again, this is based off of prototype paperwork. The Iowa Interstate does have a series of track charts and spotting aids that they give to their crews, uh, but they obviously never developed one for the, the Hills line. So I had to take what they had developed for other portions of the layout and adapt it to uh, mine, but also add a little bit of, of flourish to it. So what you have at the top of the bottom are for the two customers, City Carton at the top and Stutzman uh, Incorporated at the bottom basically shows you where cars should be placed, any obstructions or any other uh, uh, clearance issues that you may have to handle with, uh, as well as just some, again, environmental stuff to help establish the atmosphere of operating on, a railroad, on this railroad. The third document is the most important procedure that we have on this entire layout because this is the one that is uniquely of the modern era and that's red zone protection. Now you may have heard this as three-step protection uh, on other railroads, on the Iowa interstate, they call it red zone. And basically is whenever, before any crew member can step in between cars to couple air hoses, open angle clocks, apply or release handbrakes, whatever, they have to apply red zone protection, which involves centering the reverser and applying the independent brake. The third step, which they do not do, turning off the generator field, uh, the Iowa Interstate does not do that because they believe it, it, they believe that it provides too much wear and tear on the locomotives to be sitting there turning them on and off, on and off, on and off. Although I know that there are plenty of regional and even class one railroads that do take that third extra step. But this is perfectly lifted from the Iowa Interstate timetable. Uh, it is the definition of exactly what you need to do and how you need to do it. The idea being that you read it one time and you know how to do it. But this, there is one, if there's one procedure that to me defines the modern era, that defines my approach to rail to model railroading, it is red zone protection. Now, the nice thing is, is all of this paperwork really comes in handy because we have some tools that can help us emulate these procedures. And by far the biggest one is the proto throttle. Now, full disclosure, <clears throat> Scott Thornton, uh, 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 excuse me, Nathan Holmes and Michael Zucker are friends of mine. They have been friends of mine long before they developed the proto throttle. We all have an interest in the Iowa Interstate Railroad. So uh, I'm not here to shill for them. They do a darn fine job all by themselves. But when this product came out, I said it right then, the first time I saw it, I still will say it today. This for me has been a game changer in how I approach model railroading. And not only in being able to replicate as much as possible being in, a, in front of an EMD control stand in a locomotive, but how you can then apply that three-step protection. How do you do red zone? You set and center, and you can do that on the proto throttle. They've recently come out with a, a, a firmware upgrade that uh, uh, provides for air, air uh, excuse me, air brake test, excuse me, uh, where you can simulate obviously pumping up the pressure. Um, again, because of the nature of how I approach model railroading, we're not doing a lot of those initial brake tests, those initial uh, pumps up. We're doing the, the, when the, the, the intermediate ones where the cars are added or dropped, but just being able to actually have a tactile function applied to that procedure has brought brake tests back into uh, my approach. I'm not a fan of doing things on a railroad that just basically involve you pausing uh, for a second. I'm not a fan, you know, I, I've, I've, I used to do this and more knows I've been on operators like, okay, I'm gonna set the handbrakes now. You know, okay, fine, I'll just take a drink. You know, we, we don't need to, I, I, I need to have something a little bit more tactile to say, okay, I'm actually doing something and something is happening. This provides that. And so that procedure of the brake tests have come back uh, at a very limited amount, but they have come back on the railroad and it's directly uh, because of the proto throttle. Uh, the last chilling thing that I'll say about them is that obviously uh, for many years, I've been a user and a fan of the easy DCC system from CVP products. Uh, when the proto throttle came out, I, I decided I wanted to take advantage of, of a little bit more direct connection to the throttle bus. And so uh, upgraded or, or moved over, I should say, to the power cab from NCE. Again, it's kind of overkill for the nature of the layout, but it works really well and the feedback is 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 next is just 
nothing tops it. Uh, I also just completed a major upgrade of every single decoder on my locomotive fleet. Only have four locomotives, so it didn't take that long. But uh, the move to uh, loc sounds, uh, or at least second generation decoders uh, from what I had, which were Mm, the oldest Dakotas known to man, uh, that really has brought uh, some enjoyment real back to, to the operating of, of my locomotives and really taking advantage of, of all of the advances over the past decade and change that have come in technology. Uh, one of the big advances, obviously, that directly applies to this railroad is whenever we go across a grade, uh, the combination of the proto throttle uh, along with Lux Sound, uh, Lux Sound allows for just near perfect replication of the grade crossing whistle. Uh, the grade crossings themselves are, of course, powered by the grade crossing pro from Logic Rail Tech. And so I'll throw in my two cents for Chuck and his amazing company as well. Uh, this is a former electric interurban, so there are grade crossings out the wazoo on this layout. And so that is really probably the number one thing that you do operating on this layout is really just blowing for great crossings. Uh, but not everything is thousands of dollars in technology and, and a lot of soldering. Sometimes even the simplest things uh, work the best. Uh, we do not use caboosters because it's the modern era and the red trains are not long enough to require a true EOT uh, device where you have to put pressure back on the cab. So for a majority of trains on the Iowa interstate that are not on the main, a flag cover indicates the end of the train. Uh, I used to make my own and they were grossly out of size and they looked really bad until a company called Mac Rail Products out of Fort Worth started coming out with their versions of end of train flags. Uh, the, again, the, the, the cottage, the mom and pop approach, the cottage approach of this industry is where this, or where this hobby uh, uh, lives, breathes, and dies. With respect to, to Walters and respect to Atlas, respect to Dathrin and everybody else, uh, it is the mom and pop shops that, that make a good railroad great. And so I'm grateful for these manufacturers being able to, to provide uh, all this that they do in this industry. So we've set up at Maiden Lane, we've built, we've made sure we're all good, we've headed through town, we've blown for every single grade crossing, and we're going to go to one of two customers at the two extreme ends of the line. Uh, City Carton Recycling, which is down in the lower right hand corner, is, you know, a pretty standard uh, uh, industry. It's just in and out one spot at a time, one car at a time, nothing major. But as I mentioned, uh, you know, the reason for existence of this entire line is uh, Stutzman Ag Products at the very uh, end of the line in Hills, which is in the upper right hand corner. Um, I, I, I wish I could show you more right now, but this is what Hills looks like right now. Uh, and so, you know, we'll get there at some point, but right here and now construction is still underway. When that gets fully up and running, uh, this is going to be a multi-spot, multi-placement, multi-car load uh, industry and really serves as the sole reason for this line to exist. As I've said, without the uh, assessment, there is no hills. And so it's not a switching puzzle. Uh, at least I hope it's not a switching puzzle, uh, but it will challenge, definitely challenges me sometimes. And I know it'll challenge uh, my guests on uh, going through the process of how to best effectively work this industry. Now, I mentioned the, uh, uh, the, the, the customer diagrams and kind of how we, how we connect everything together and how we spot everything. Uh, I mentioned the, uh, that there's a prototype for everything. This is an actual uh, prototype document for, uh, that I was able to acquire a couple of years back showing the spots and placements for all the cars at Stutzman in Hills. And you can see that there are eight separate spots for one industry. And so that really taking the time and trying to figure out, okay, what's the best way to spot and place all these cars? Because it's not just the grand pull and the grand shove. Cars are going to be in place. Cars are going to be where you need to work around them or adjust them in such a way that they, that they uh, are moved in an efficient manner. And so you're not just wasting time. Uh, Hills takes up a large portion of this road. The entire northern wall of this house is, is basically the town of Hills. And so doing a giant runaround just to get into one spot is kind of inefficient. And so by just giving the opportunity to take your time and work through how you're going to work it, I think will be a real challenge 
for anybody uh, that comes here and hopefully a, a definitely enjoyable time. Uh, you're also going to add with this industry uh, specific spots, making sure that you're over hoses, making sure that you're over grates for, for when cars are spotted, making sure that you're lined up with doors. All the tips and tricks that you have all heard about, we've all heard about over the years are being applied to this railroad in some way, shape or form. Again, referencing prototype procedures and trying to replicate in, to the point of duplicating as much as humanly possible. Now, there's one procedure that I have not yet implemented on the Hills line, and I'm not quite sure if I'm going to, and that's actual locks on all the switches and all the gates and all the derails. Uh, on the Hill, on the Grimes line, excuse me, uh, I went through the process of adding locks to every single turnout uh, so that you could not throw the turnout without first unlocking it. I have an article in Model Railroad Hobbyist that came out in 2015, I believe, uh, uh, talking about the process of retrofitting uh, kind of a Rube Goldberg approach to locks uh, on the railroad. As of right now, that hasn't yet made its way to the Hills Line. And the big reason is that there weren't a lot of locks on the Hills Line. There were a couple of places where they were strategically put, um, but during my modeled era, a lot of things were just kept up and so I'm, I'm really kind of working on if and how I want to. Right now, my knee-jerk reaction is no, I'm not going to put locks uh, back on this railroad just because of the nature of this, of this railroad. Get back to me in a year. I'll let you know what I, what I do decide. But one thing that has changed from the Grimes line is the, is the uh, documentation of, of demerge time and dwelling points. And that was a discussion that I had had uh, with a friend of mine uh, who works for a class one railroad uh, here in Des Moines, and I will not say any more than that, about just how important it was to document when a car was spot and when a car spotted and when a car was pulled. And the light went on and I said, that is something that I don't care what you're modeling, where you're modeling, how you're modeling. That is something that every single last one of us can do. Uh, it, it, it is just make a note of I pulled this car at this time. It's just one more thing and it just adds so much uh, for doing absolutely next to nothing. So for every car pull, you basically just reference time of day. Um, if you wear a watch, just look down at your, at your watch. Uh, over the years, I have stopped wearing a wristwatch because I have a mobile device in my pocket and that's become uh, my wristwatch. So the nice thing is that the Protothottle does uh, interface with a, a, uh, a fast clock, uh, both from Modric, available from Logic Rail or from a couple of other through JMRI. Uh, I do not use fast time on the railroad because that doesn't make a lot of sense for a railroad this small. So we just use time of day. Uh, and so if you're operating by yourself, you just look down at the throttle and go, Okay, that's the time of day, make the mark, move on. But when I have other crew members around, uh, we I realized we needed an actual standard clock uh, uh, on the layout. Uh, the One of the nice things about working for uh, television and broadcasting is that occasionally you get access to some old technology. Uh, and so I was able to pick up this network time display from an old television station that was being upgraded, uh, sitting on the route, and it basically references the U.S. atomic clock uh, in Boulder and tells me the time down to the nanosecond. So it's just one big, giant standard clock. I don't recommend that you all go out and buy NTP time displays, but, you know, hey, if you've got the ability, why not show off just a little bit? So as we kind of come to the end, I want to, I want to kind of, kind of sum this up and what I'm going to call my blatantly obvious lessons learned. And again, when I started, I don't think that anything that I have just said is groundbreaking or in any way is going to change any of your approaches uh, to a model revving. But for me, but if I were somebody were to ask me, what are the three big lessons that I've learned from the operating scheme of this layout, I would point to this. Number one is probably the most obvious, slow down. Um, I, I know that a thousand people say that. I know that we've heard that time and time again, just slow down. Well, I just mean, I don't want to stand there and do that. I'm saying, I'm, that, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is just slow down. Just take your time before you get to, are, are you just, you good? All right, let's go. Uh, there was a, I, I, I heard the phrase, it came from a, a crew member at the Iowa Interstate. He said that the secret is to plan your work and then work your plan. And that that if for all of our operators, let's just let's take that phrase and kind of move forward at, about it. Just before you do anything, just take five seconds and go. Are you good? Go. It will remove stress. It will remove issues just like there's no tomorrow if we just all slow down a little bit. Number two, find your slice. 
uh, it was Lance Midheim who said this uh, as far as it relates to layout design. He said that we should be cropping, not compressing. And the what what he and I'm going to summarize this. And I apologize if he's on this. I apologize. Uh, and if anybody, and I, I apologize for kind of butchering what he said. But basically, for a, if you had a prototype scene that was this long, instead of trying to take it this long and push it into a space this big, what he's saying is that out of this whole space you should only model that much. And that same approach is, should be applied not only to design, but also to operating uh, a model railroad. Find your slice. This is a single job. And it is that, again, the nail of the elephant, not the entire elephant. And so just being able to find what really works for you and more importantly, what really works for me, I've been very successful and very happy with my approach toward model rarity by not trying to take it all, but instead of just taking a slice. And the third one, and I, I'm going to thank all of you for this one, is just ask questions. Uh, the, 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 if I said at the beginning of the presentation, I'll say it right now, if there has been a silver lining line to all of this, it's that it's connected more people in ways that, that we never would have been able to do. To do. Um, there's no way that I would have been able to come meet with all of you. There's no way that I would have been able to go to as many uh, uh, RPM meets or whatever over the course of the past year to get the knowledge that I have gotten. But you just have to ask questions. We were all beginners at some point. Just you'd be amazed what kind of information you can get if you just take five seconds to say, hey, can you tell me about fill in the blank. Uh, basically, over the past 15 years, give or take, that I've been interested in the Iowa interstate, it's been a thoroughly enjoyable experience. Uh, and, and even on a railroad as small as the Iowa interstate, especially when you compare it to uh, some of the big, obviously the class ones or even the larger uh, regional railroads, uh, it's nice to know that there really is a little portion that's available for me and a little portion that's available for basically anybody. And if, if the lesson is to be learned, it's that there's a prototype for everyone. You just have to look for it. So this is where I get a little arrogant. More information about the Iowa Interstate and my version of the Hills Line is available from a couple of sources. The first, for those of you who are model railroad to video plus or trains.com subscribers, thank you very much. Uh, you can continue to watch the full series of the Hills Line with James McNabb on model railroad or video plus. Uh, for those of you who do not subscribe, shame on you, but there is the complete series now available from the Kalmbach Hobby Store on DVD in which I go into detail about the entire layout, not just the operating aspects of it. Uh, I do maintain a series of online presences and social media accounts at thehillsline.com on YouTube, Flickr, and Instagram. Try to post to them on a somewhat regular basis. But as was mentioned by Eric at the very beginning, the best and the greatest place to find out the latest on the layout is always on the website at thehillsline.com. Uh, gentlemen, I thank you all very much for this opportunity to speak with you this afternoon. I will now answer absolutely any question on absolutely any topic that you so desire. Well, I think we'll stick to model railroading topics because that could go real badly real <laughs> quick. So, uh, James, thanks so much for presenting. We really do appreciate it. Um, I'm going to go through the questions here. Let's see. Da, 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 da. Uh, the first question, somebody asked, how are the end of car flags made? I put a link. To, you said that was the MacRail product? Correct. It's MacRail okay. products. Uh, I, I threw a link. They're, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I I've got them sitting over here. They're the wonderful little things. Too. Yeah, they, they, I love their um, the EOT devices. If I see them at a store, at a show or something, I'm going to buy them. It's, I love those mm -hmm. things. Uh, the name of the product program you used. Uh, Phil put a link for that. Uh, there's a comment about Highway US Six also runs through Glenwood Canyon, closed for many more weeks due to a major rock and mudslide. Uh, Highway 6 also runs about a mile from where I grew up in Valparaiso, Indiana. It's, it's a really long highway. So uh, let's see. Chuck asked the question, do the ditch lights flash when the horn is blown on the prototrot? Uh, that is not on this railroad because the Iowa, the, at least my model of locomotives, the, the, the GP38s do not have the flashing ditch lights. That's only on the uh, ES44 ACs that they do that, which okay. don't run on this line. Um, to answer your question, what he's actually asking, that is decoder specific. That is not yeah. protocol throttle specific. Yep. So yeah, that's, that's, that's the you, trigger to go from yeah. there. Yeah. Yep. That's something you set up in the decoder. So um, uh, those are all the written questions. I'm going to let, I'm going to flip the security here. 
Um, if you have a question for James, you can unmute yourself and ask it. James, did, when you had to tear your old layout out, did you give any thought to trying to save it and rebuild it? Thanks, John. Uh, yeah, that lasted for about 12 minutes. Um, it, it, uh, when, when the, when we found out that, that we had to, that they had to replace the entire sewer line, the, the guy was standing, the plumber was standing down here and we were talking and he was going, this is a great layout. And I'm like, yeah, it's got to go. Doesn't it? He's like, we could probably work around it, but it would just be considerably easier. And so I, uh, when the day came that I had to come it up, I, I, I did try to save segments and I just got to the point. I said, this is, I'm, it's never going to be go back together. It's never going to be again. And so things just started going to the dumpster because they had to. Um, I was fortunate that I was able to save a small portion as a display. It's actually sitting right down here. Uh, that is the Hickman Road overpass segment from the old Rhymes line. Uh, I saved it as a uh, 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 just kind of a remember of the way things used to be. Uh, but no, that uh, it, it took me about 12 minutes to realize it wasn't going to be saved. Yeah, and I think it, you said it was a sewer line that went. Yeah, uh, that's, well, I mean, anything, yeah. anything in that water is pretty much trashed. I mean, that's yeah. Uh, so this house, like I said, the house is 98 years old. Um, uh, we bought it 12, 13 years ago now at this point. Uh, when, when they pulled out the sewer line, the entire, but it was a cast iron sewer line, the main sewer line, and the entire bottom of the sewer line had basically just, just completely disintegrated. Uh, that's not something that happens overnight. That's something that takes years and decades. So we, the entire time we've been living in this house, basically we had a, we're living in a giant open sewer. And you hear the rumors about what happens to houses built on like ancient Indian burial grounds. I want to know what happens to houses that are built on giant open sewers. So we'll find out. <laughs> Hi James. Nothing, uh, nothing good. I right. noticed yeah, your your layout set 54 inches above the floor, correct? Correct. Okay. Have you had any misgivings about putting it up that high or it's actually okay. considerably lower than the Grimes line? Uh and, and so it, it it's it's a good height. I'm right at six feet tall. Um, so it's a good height for me. I mean, it's right at about that, that armpit. Uh, you know, kind of, kind of upper sternum height, which you hear right in about. Um, the the only real issue is that, as you know, my son I have to kind of pick him up to have him look at, it, but he'll, he'll keep growing and we'll we'll get it up there. Um, I, I I really like the height. I think this is a good trade off between the depth of the scene, which is about 16 inches all the way around, uh, and just kind of keeping the railroad up into a, a viable height, plus having the space underneath for storage. Um, I really wanted this this time around the basement to be more than just a railroad room. I wanted it to be more of a family space. Uh, if, we run, if we, could. We run so a 50 really inch up. rail height on our railroad. The, we're another micro micro railroad like you have, Porta Catusa. And so at 50 inches, you know, what we did with grandkids is we got those little ladders at Walmart. Those work great. <laughs> so anyway, but. No, it was interesting. It, uh, it is right nice to have that storage area under the layout. Uh, one thing I've noticed too is I can sit on a on a uh, office chair and roll in to work underneath the layout and not have to bend over and all that. So yeah, there's a lot to be said for a higher height railroad. So anyway, beautiful railroad, man. I really like what you've done. I'd love to be able to operate on it someday, but I was kind of far away from Oklahoma, so. Anyway, Not a problem. Understood. great, Thank great you, job, man. Thank you. Uh -huh. I have a question. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, hi, Nevin Wilson, West Virginia. Uh, my question is, is how many operators can operate on your railroad at a time? And is this railroad more complicated to operate than the previous layout? Um, does it take more time? Does an operating session last longer? Okay, so uh, right, the, the, the maximum is two, but you can wait your turn. Uh, it, again, it, it, because of the nature of the railroad, we can recycle real quick. So I, there was a time I had six people in here and it, uh, it was like, okay, you guys go, we'll, we'll, we'll talk, we'll have a drink, we'll, we'll shoot the, the bull. All right, next, you know, go from there. So, so you know, social distancing notwithstanding, I'll, I'll, I'll take all comers, you just gotta wait your turn. Uh, uh, basically, um, uh, the as far as the complexity and the and the amount of time, it's basically six of one, half dozen of the other. 
Uh, the Grimes line was more like a suburban short line. And so you had a lot of long running per se, uh, where you went all the way to the end of the line and then you worked your way back. But the industries themselves were all, you know, trailing point switches once you got to the end of the line and you just kind of worked from it. So it was just about, about just running. This is more about... Uh, <sighs> complex spotting of cars because you're coming in in the middle and then you're going to the two edges and depending on how you approach it you could go that way you could go that way you could shuttle back and forth it, it's really up up to you and so it, it's it's the same flavor that i previously had it's just a different different course more or less same meal different course for lack of a better term i don't know if that helped or not yes i got a quick question uh, Jason from Jason from Minneapolis. Curious about the proto throttle. I've been eyeing it for a couple of years. Uh, does that take? Is there a lot of investment into getting that set up and mapped to all the you know specific functions with each locomotive and each different decoder type out there? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and 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 you know I I'm a I'm a fan and and they're my friends. But yeah, it it is an investment. It is an investment in time. It is an investment of 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 money. It's an expensive product. Uh, it, it's investment of a lot of things. And I, I'm I'm the, a, a bad example of of the proto throttle because of the nature of, of my layout. Um, I, I all my locomotives, you know, I'm running single units, and so it doesn't it didn't take me that long to set up the entire fleet. Um, consequently, I don't traditionally take my locomotives and go elsewhere. Uh, and so one of the things is that once you set up a locomotive for, for a locomotive for the proto throttle, it doesn't really work with another throttle. And the reason is because of the speed steps that you have to set up, because of the momentum that you have to set up, because of the uh, uh, all the functions and, and, and the controls. It really is unique to that proto throttle. Um, that to me is a wonderful thing because it's just I'm going to do everything on the proto throttle once the end of it. But if you have a situation where, you know, you've got maybe have only one proto throttle and the other ones are NCE hammerheads, uh, there's, I, I've not experienced that, so I can't really speak if what that's going to do. Uh, it's been my experience that once I went with the proto throttle, that was it. Okay, thank you. Okay. All right, any other questions? I will take your total silence tacit acceptance of all of my processes as the way that we should all be moving forward. So I appreciate that. This is the way everything should be done. And these are the new rules. We'll, we'll get those published yeah. in, the, in the next session. So anyway, James, thanks again for presenting. It was a great presentation. Um, and again, the links to the uh, James's layout, uh, hillsline.com, as well as the link to the MacRail products um, they've got some great, uh, I particularly like their EOT devices that you can basically fit, they will fit into a KD coupler. You can pull them out, put them back in They're, Like I said, I just got to get my hands on some of them. Um, so anyway, um, we're going to stop the recording. <laughs>